How's it going, everyone, and welcome all in for another episode of the unofficial WCC Hoops podcast. Uh, we got a lot to get into uh, this week. Glad, actually, to have on Tanner Gardner, the new director of athletics at Pepperdine, um, to hop on, and we'll talk a lot about what's happening at Pepperdine. Obviously, new head coach, n- new AD. They're building a new facility on the campus as well, um, new basketball facility, multi-purpose whatnot i'll talk a little bit more about that but that's um we'll get into all pepperdine things later on in the show so i'm really happy to kind of be able to bring that in um also wanted to talk a little bit about the olympians uh that we're going to be seeing in just a couple of weeks a good number of familiar faces on the wcc front that will that have already started making the trip over to paris as we started to see some of those exhibition games start to tip off and get going but as and also summer league has started, and yes, there's a lot ton of WCC guys that are uh, making making names for themselves in summer league. Uh, Jamari Bouye has actually been one of the guys uh, more recently that's actually kind of been in the last few days been really playing well uh, down there for the San Antonio Spurs summer league squad on the same team with uh, Yawan Masalski and then also um, Luke Adalovich from. From Pacific, so there's a few WCC guys on that San Antonio squad, um, but again, like a ton of guys with great opportunities there in Vegas. And as this was starting to happen, it got me thinking about the the stars of tomorrow, the stars of this coming season, and who those breakout stars might be in the WCC, because we know who a lot of the, the established names are. We know the Ryan Nemharts. We know the Augustus Marshallonis, the Graham E. Ks. We know about we know about uh, <clears throat> Adama Ball. Like we have like these established names, Marcus Williams in the league. And it got me thinking about who is going to be some of those names that could break out next year and play a more significant role on their squads for various reasons. Uh and I mean, there's a lot of really good talent that's gonna be either growing into new roles or is transferred into the league and there's a lot to kind of like start to kind of peek on so i'll but i'll i'll start with just a few names that really are standing out to me and a few guys that i think are going to kind of really make that jump uh this coming year and yeah i'm going to start off with maybe it's a little bit of the personal bias because it is saint mary's but i'm going with jordan ross here and Jordan Ross, we saw toward the end of last year, really kind of step in and be and be really one of the leaders on that squad and running the offense when either Aiden Mahaney or Augustus Marshallonis were unable to do so. Uh, we saw this in the NCAA tournament game against Grand Canyon, where he was actually one of the bright spots, maybe for me, definitely the the brightest of spots in that game because you saw just the different dynamic that he was able to bring and his playmaking ability, his ability to get to the basket uh, and create shots for not only himself, but for others Uh, that, and we're starting to see, and I've seen like some video whatnot of him uh, training in the off season. Of course, you always have to take that with a grain of salt, but this is a guy who was really highly touted coming in. You knew was going to take a little bit of time to kind of grow. And with the departure of Aiden Mahaney, it opens the door for Jordan Ross, especially in a system with a team that historically has actually run two point guards out there at the same time. In fact, that's probably uh, what Randy Bennett would prefer. You look at a lot of the teams, you look at the the Todd Gold and Patty Mills's teams or the Mickey McConnell, Matthew Delavadova, Joe Rahan, Emmett Nahr. Uh, there's there's plenty of you got Tommy Cousy, Jordan Ford. There's plenty of examples of this team running really like two point guard sets. And now likely, I think, we're going to see the Marshallonis Ross set in the backcourt, at least to start. 
um, the start the season and that he's, he's one I'm like, I'm really kind of keen in on as being one of those breakout players uh, going into next year. Another, another name that really kind of sticks out to me is, is the Washington uh, transfer to Washington state, Nate Calmes. Uh This was a guy who was the Southern play, Southern conference freshman of the year, a couple of seasons ago. Transferred to Washington last year, really didn't get a whole lot of playing time, but we did see flashes. He had 15 points against Arizona in in Pac-12 play. This is this is, again, this is a guy who's going to be in a team that's really had a lot of turnover. Only four percent of last year's minutes come back to Washington State, and yes, there are a few Eastern Washington guys coming over uh, with with David Riley. And so there's some familiarity there, and there might be early on some heavy, maybe a little bit more leaning on the guys he's he's familiar with and knows his system. But the addition of Nate Calmes really, to me, is going to be the one to watch uh, because it's going to be his real first opportunity to kind of be in the lineup on a regular basis, to have the opportunity to possibly lead a team um, here with Washington State, this new look Washington State team. So. Looking at Nate Calmes, I think that's the guy I would kind of key in on as far as someone who's going to be able to take that next leap, be able to show off what he's able to do and le- and lead that uh, Cougar squad going into next year. And another one that I think has been kind of growing and growing as we've as we saw throughout the course of the season last year, but then also just the opportunities he's getting in the not in the off season, uh, Jake Emz- Ensminger, he ha- he does all the little things right. Uh, he kind of reminds me t- to an extent of like you think about like guys who do all the little things but also have high potential. To an ex- again, not comparing them as players, but it's a little Anton Watson esque to an extent of he does all the little things right. He makes winning plays. Like he he's going to be in the right spot at the right time, and we've seen some of the potential that he has over the course of this past year. Uh, he went back over uh, to Europe to, to participate uh, in, in summer leagues over there. Uh, so he's going to get additional experience before he does return uh, to the States and to Santa Clara, because then this Santa Clara team, yes, does have a lot of talent returning. Dove has, has I believe it's the second most minutes of any WCC team coming back. But he's a key part of that, and he's going to play, I think, a bigger role going into next year with some of the other pieces that, yes, like you still have to kind of fill in some gaps here and there. You still have some guys who have solidified spots, but he's going to he's going to force his way into the lineup, I think, more often than not come this coming year. So Jake Ensminger is a guy you really have to watch out who I think could be a breakout star uh, going into next year. And just a couple. And just another name that kind of sticks out to me, just like based off of numbers again, like as we're starting to learn about Washington State, Oregon State, and what those programs are going to look like as they translate to the WCC, I do think that there's going to be a learning curve here. And so I, one of the names that stuck out to me just based off like his numbers in sophomore year in hope, and in a way it's like thinking of what he might look like in in next year is Michael Rataj, eight points per game, nearly six rebounds. Um, coming into his junior year this coming season, this is a guy who's going to, again, have a larger load kind of placed on him because of the number of departures that Oregon State had. And also the fact that you're coming into a, a you add a lot of guys, you're going to kind of lean on the guys you know and the guys who kind of are a little bit more familiar with the system, at least early on. And he's going to be one of those guys early on who's going to get that opportunity. You've seen this numbers are there. He has the right size again, like this WCC has a lot of big, big guys and legitimate uh, skilled big guys up and down the conference. So this is a key part in what Oregon state is going to be able to have to kind of bring, because we know this Santa Clara is like one of the biggest teams in the country. Gonzaga always has a lot of size. St. Mary's has a lot of size. USF will bring some size. LMU has brought in more size as well. So you have a lot of teams that have, really trying to like get bigger and make really because you're trying to like match up with St. Mary's and Gonzaga, because that's who you have to get through. Guy like Michael Rataj is going to fit right in with that sort 
with that sort of thinking. So I, I'm looking at him as another guy to really kind of be one of those breakout stars uh, for this coming year. And I'm not going to go into too much detail. There were a few other guys that kind of like popped up in my mind of, oh yeah, these could be other guys. Jan Vitti at LMU was another one that kind of popped up to me. Again, UCLA transfer coming over uh, across, across the city to go play for the Lions. That's a that's a big move. I think there's going to be definitely some eyes on that on that team, and then on V Day specifically. Uh, Carlton Lingard Jr. for USF. This is really the the Jonathan Mobo replacement. Really, now as we look at it today, it is. And there was a there was a lot of like eyes and and paying attention to his movement in the offseason. A lot of good things said about what he was able to bring to the table at U. Uh, UTSA and what he's going to be able to bring as he moves over to USF and playing again that Jonathan Mobile role probably in that four or five uh, spot going into next year. And then the other one I think is going to be interesting to watch. Me, I mean, the whole team is going to be interesting to watch, but over at Pacific, I'm kind of I'm looking at Jazz Gardner because this was a former four star recruit that went to Nevada, really didn't play all that much uh, while he was there has come back to, has moved back uh, to California in the WCC. And this Pacific program needs a lot. And there's, so there's going to be ample opportunity to show what he's capable of doing because this is a blank slate for a team that has, for external, I would say, has low, low expectations. And anything that this program can do, anything that the players on this team can do to move this program forward, is going to be a big lift. And I believe that Jazz Gardner is going to be a big part of that um, as we get closer and closer to the season. All right. And I did want to talk a little bit about uh, the Olympians. And again, like to talk about those breakout stars because <laughs> there's plenty of uh, WCC guys who are probably, I think most of them are actually making like their sec, at least their second appearance. Uh, playing for their national teams, a couple making their first. Andrew Nemhard making his first for Canada, and this is this is a big opportunity for him. Again, we saw what uh, Andrew Nemhard was able to do with the Pacers this past season. He's really turned into one of the brighter young stars in the league, and with a Canadian team that is a good team. This is a pretty good Canadian team, albeit what we saw at the end of their matchup with Team USA, because well, it's Team USA. You Shea Gilders Alexander, you look at the fact that you have Dylan Brooks, you have Kelly O'Linick, the other Zag on that squad. This is a this is a solid, solid team that's going to be, I think, in the conversation of getting deeper into that Olympic tournament. Andrew Nembard, I think, is going to be a big part of their success one way or the other uh, as they as they play and get deeper and deeper in Paris. And and another one I just kind of like want to think about because again. There is a difference between what we see in the NBA, what we saw in college, and what we see in the Olympics. And I think there's maybe no um, better case of that than Patty Mills, who is going into his fifth Olympics with the Australian national team. And Patty Mills in the NBA has turned, has what, 13 years in the league at this point, and has turned himself into a a very, very good shooter, a very good role player uh, in the NBA. Again, like he's lasted in the league for over a decade. And that says a lot about the type of the type of work ethic and the type of care, player that he turned himself into, which was very different which I, from what you, we saw him be at the very beginning of his NBA career. He That three-point shot, which is now kind of like his his go is what he's most known for now is not what he was most known for at the very beginning. And, and I mentioned this because of the type of player he ends up being in the Olympics, because he turns almost into Superman in the Olympics. Uh, he has been team Australia's best player for the better part of 20 years. And he has been, and we've seen him have his best games against some of the best competition that they've gone up against team USA. We've seen it against Argentina. We've seen, we've seen against Spain, like Patty Mills steps up in the Olympics and because he knows like he is the guy for that squad. And yes, like we know, like even with 
the Australian team, there's a lot of other NBA guys on that squad over the over the course of the years. We've had Aaron Baines. There has been Joe Ingles. There's obviously Matthew Della Vadova, Jock Landale. You have Andrew Bogut, who's been on that squad a number of times. But the guy on that squad, the really the, the most impactful player has been Patty Mills. And think and looking at the way just he just like turns it on in the, in international competition is kind of what we could see from a number of guys. And I could, again, this is why I kind of go back. Andrew Nebhardt could be that guy this year. Uh, we could see that from Rui Hachimura on, on the Japanese team. We could see that from Philip Petrusev on the Serbian team. And I do think there's probably a little bit better chance of it happening with uh, Rui Hachimura just based on the squad that he is with. Uh, but there's but there's a lot of opportunities for the guys who are going to be playing for their countries. Uh, and this is just going to be a lot of fun as we get get closer to Olympic play and we see the last of these exhibitions before we get into the real part of that tournament. All right. So thinking about like players and breakout stars and whatnot, Pepperdine is one of those programs to me that is kind of like, there's clearly potent, a lot of potential at Pepperdine. Now, if you look at outside of basketball, Pepperdine is one of the most successful non-football programs in the entire country. This is a this is a school that wins national championships and is on the national championship level in a lot of sports. And you look at obviously volley on the volleyball front, on golf, on tennis. This is a this is a school that ha- won a baseball championship in 1992. This is this is a program and a school that does yield a lot of high level results. Also a reminder that Pepperdine was the top of the WCC until it was, until Gonzaga came around and took over. It was Pepperdine for a long, long time. And what they have done, I think one of the things, and we'll talk a little bit about it with, um, uh, we'll talk a little bit, about it with uh, Tanner Gardner, the uh, new AD at Pepperdine, a little bit more is just the not the, the financial investment, but also just like the cultural investment at Pepperdine. Uh, one of the things I was that a big part of it is the Mountain at Mullen Park, which is the new uh, basketball and really kind of like just a student center uh, community center that Pepperdine is building. They broke ground on it last August, uh, September in 2023. And this is going to host a number of things, obviously like a student rec center. There's going to be an entertainment center and a new 3,600 seat gym on the campus. And anyone who's made that trip to Pepperdine knows that Fire, Firestone Fieldhouse is, is past its prime and they needed the change. And this building is going to be able to give it to them. Uh, it is set to open in the fall of 26. So there's obviously a couple more years before they get to that point, but now there's something to look at. And this is going to be the first new, brand new basketball facility in the WCC since the McCarthy Center, since the new kennel was finished in 2006. So long, long time coming for really anyone in the WCC uh, to be able to show off a new facility, a new building, and really kind of like point toward the future of what that what Pepperdine Athletics is going to look like going forward. All right, with that, bring in uh, Tanner Gardner, the new director of athletics at Pepperdine, and we'll talk with him about what the the outlook is, the his relationship with new head coach Ed Schilling, and we'll get into all of that. I'm happy to bring in Tanner Gardner, the new the new director of athletics at Pepperdine University. He is coming in from Rice, where he spent a good a good amount of time down in the Houston region, uh, helping Rice University transition from Conference USA over to the American Athletic Conference. A lot of experience, student athlete back at Stanford it, way back when. Tanner, thanks for hopping on and uh, welcome uh, to the WCC. How been? How has been your first uh, full month on the job? Yeah, Zach, uh, greetings from Malibu and uh, great to be with you today. Um, Man, my first month on the job has been fantastic. Uh, although, as you you likely know, uh, even though I officially started on June first, there was a lot of work to do prior to that. We hired new basketball coaches in 
uh, April for both the men's and the women's program. Um, and then since I started on June 1st, we've hired a new baseball coach. So w- we were off and running before June 1st, and we picked up the pace a little bit after June 1st, but um, almost settled here in Malibu, and everything is going quite well so far, Zach. And as you kind of like made that transition, uh, what's, I guess early on, what's like been like some of your favorite parts of being on the job and what's, how, what are some of the, like the, the strong connection that you've been able to make uh, in your uh, short time there at the university to this point? Yeah. I mean, I, I think what, what attracted me to Pepperdine and what has struck me the most in my time here is just how great people we have around here. Um, starting at the top, um, we have a very supportive a board of trustees. We have a visionary uh, president who cares a lot about athletics, and we have a supportive administration um, who, who not only wants our university to be successful, but wants athletics to be a key part of that. And so working with people that have similar interests and goals and objectives as you do um, makes a tremendous working environment. And then here in the athletic department, I mean, we really have a great team. Um, I think we have some of the best coaches in particular, um, not just in the conference, but in the country. And so getting to meet with them and spend time with them and learn from them um, has really been great. And then, you know, we have a, a strong and committed donor base and it's been really fun getting to know them as well. I mean, people that, that support Pepperdine are very passionate about our institution. And so kind of hearing their passion and reaffirming the reasons why I've came here has really been the highlight of my time so far. I mean, one of the things I think like that, I mean, I focus on men's basketball, obviously on this podcast, but Pepperdine is, is one of the the national leaders in so many other sports. And I think that's one of the things that is sometimes missed about uh, when we talk about like some of these schools. And this is a school that's coming off its fourth commissioner's cup uh, just this past year. And kind of talk about, even though, yes, there's going to be a ton of focus on men's basketball, just like as you look at the program, the athletic department in its totality um, and like what that has kind of like, why that was not kind of a part of that attraction to Pepperdine and what, like, the, again, you talk about some of the best coaches in the country. Like that's kind of like what you're, I know you're kind of like leaning toward it. This is a competitive program, like up and down the athletic department. Yeah. I mean, listen, excellence is in our ethos, Zach. And I think that's a big part of why I wanted to come here. You know, it, when I was at Rice, um, we were very proud of the fact that we had won a national championship. We won the 2003 baseball championship there. It's really hard to win national championships. And there are many schools that had it. Uh, Mississippi State won the baseball championship a couple of years ago. That was their first national championship ever. This is a marquee SEC school. And they won their first national championship within the last couple of years. And so we have, I think, 14 national championships here. I was actually um, speaking to a class uh, yesterday in our trophy room upstairs. And there's a wall of NCAA championship trophies. That doesn't happen very many places. Getting one's hard. Getting 14 is really incredible. And so uh, working at a place that has that rich history of success, um, and it's not just in, in our Olympic sports, but you know we have tradition of success in sports like men's and women's basketball. We won the 1992 uh, Baseball National Championship. We were in the Super Regionals and one out away from making uh, the College World Series in baseball as recently as 2015. And so... I mean, I, I think Pepperdine's a special place. We we won the uh, the the non football uh, directors' cup, or I think they call it the all sports cup, uh, two of the last three years, I believe. And so we we have a great athletic department across the board. And you know, I I think we have had some struggles within our basketball programs and our baseball program lately. And I think that was a big part of why we decided to uh, make changes in the leadership of those programs. We had great coaches and we have um, aspiration moving forward um, to elevate those programs too. I think we, we fully fund um, 12 of our 17 programs here uh, and nine of those 12 programs have been in the top 25 within the last 18 months. Um, and, you know, we aspire to move all of our programs to that. And, Obviously, like you talked about the changes with men's basketball, and this is a program that has struggled uh, quite a bit over the last few years. Uh, but ha- but it's a program that, I mean, prior to the Gonzaga run, it was Pepperdine who was the kind of like the school in the WCC for a while. What was sort of opportunities do you can, did you see coming in and as you kind of like learned more about the program that you see with them? And, and because it's 
with there's challenges obviously with realignment and all this other movement of, like the transfer portal obviously a big part of it as you know the rosters have been heavily overturned a lot of programs dealing with the same thing what opportunities did you have you seen and are you trying to map out with the men's basketball program obviously new head coach ed Schilling in there as well and what have the conversations been with him been like yeah i mean it, it... First of all, we're thrilled uh, to have Ed as our head coach. I think Coach Schilling is exactly the right person to lead our program forward. Um, but that's just part of it, right? I think in order to be successful, particularly in you know the the highest money sports, football and men's basketball in the West Coast Conference, it's just men's basketball. Um, you have to have a full institutional commitment to be successful. Um, and we have that right now. We have a president who is committed um, to continuing the success in our other sports, but investing behind the success uh, of our men's and women's basketball programs. And so coaching is part of it. I think about it in three tiers. You need to have the right leadership. And that goes from the university to the AD to the basketball coach. You need to have the right strategy, which again goes from the university to the AD to the coach. And then you need to have the right investment. And you really have to put those three things together in order to have a successful program. I believe we have the right leadership now. I believe we have the right strategy now. A big part of, I think, what we need to do at, at, uh, at Pepperdine to be successful is to have a great development culture. Um, in the era of transfer portal and NIL, um, we might not always be able to get the, the five-star guys. But if we have good coaches who can identify under the radar talent and develop them, um, then that's going to be our calling card to success. And yeah, there might be a, a situation where some of those players transfer out, but if we build culture at the same time and, and, and that makes kids want to stay here. And if Ed has a track record of, I think he has over a hundred players in the NBA that he trained. Um, if that's the aspiration of our players, Ed can do that for you. Um, so that, that's the strategy. And then the investment is there. I mean, I think we're investing operationally behind and perhaps most importantly, and I think a major hindrance to our success in the past in basketball has been our facilities. Um, I, I don't know if you've been to a game here, within the last couple of years, we have a nice venue, but it's dated. And we have a single gym, Zach, for four court sports and all of campus. We have one gym. We had seven at Rice. Um, I'm not saying you need seven. But we have a single gym. And so as you think about the ability for our players to get better and develop, it's significantly hindered by our facility situation. We are under construction right now with a $350 million um, arena and rec center that I believe won't just be one of the nicest in the conference, but it's going to be one of the nicest in the country. And so in fall of 2026, we're moving into that. Um, and so that's the investment that we're making behind our program that is foundational to our success. Facilities aren't the answer. They're part of the answer, though. Investment's not the answer, but it has to be part of the answer. And so when you combine the leadership, the strategy and the investment, I think we're really set up well for success moving forward, Zach. And I was actually going to ask a bit about the uh, the mountain at Mullen Park, the, the new facility that Pepperdine has been building, broke ground on it last September. Uh, as you as the excitement starts to build and obviously like getting closer and closer to the data that a facility opening and being able to be not only a, a multi-use for not only the student athletes but also the the students at Pepperdine as well uh, like this it would be I think it's probably the going to be the the first new building in the WCC and probably about 15 20 years I don't think anyone's actually built a brand new facility on any campus in the, in that period of time. And so kind of as, as there's been more and more talk and as that plan is starting to develop of what, how you get closer to that date, what's kind of like now, like how does the pitch change? How does like kind of the conversation change on what Pepperdine athletics is going to look like, what it looks like today. And then what it's going to look like when these facilities, again, with other investments and other pieces kind of falling into place as well. What, what does that look like? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, a big part of building a program is selling the vision, Zach. And I think they say in the Bible, where, where there's no vision, the people perish. We have vision here. Um, and we have a, a vision that I think is compelling. And so, whereas it may have been hard to recruit coaches or student athletes here, you know, frankly, we, we don't want to take them in our locker room and facility because we want to show them the beach and the views. And that was our institutional asset before. But now we have a vision to sell the future. And I, I, I'd like to invite you to come to campus sometime uh, this fall or spring to come see what we're doing here. We have this uh, mountain showroom uh, that has uh, a large rendering of what the future mountain is going to look like. And so any of our student athletes in court sports 
Um, we walk them through that room, particularly basketball players. And I can't even tell you how exciting and momentous that has been for the student athletes who have came. And, you know, I think we have 12 new players this year. Um, and walking those guys through the showroom, that's where we take them. They see the vision there. They hear Ed's vision. They see the vision there. We, we, they meet with the president. They hear about his institutional commitment um, to athletics. And now that I'm here, they meet with me too. And I sell the vision as well. And so we have an aligned and comprehensive vision. And we have, we have proof that we're moving forward to it. I think you often are at institutions where you hear, well, hey, we're in process of planning this facility. We're going to do this or we're going to do that. And then it often never starts. Well, we can show them the showroom, Zach, and then we can take them up and show them the construction. There's a big old hole in the ground right now. And so it's happening and it's coming. And do you want to be a part of building something special? That's a question we ask people. That's what we ask our coaches when we are hiring them. And that's what we ask our student athletes when we're recruiting them. And so that's a big part of the vision. And let me say one more thing. I mean, I, I talked about building a program, being a total commitment of the institution. I talked about a couple of pieces as being leadership. Uh, strategy, and I talked a little bit about the developmental strategy, then the investment. Uh, let me talk a little bit about kind of the strategy beyond the court, right? So a big part of what we're doing with the mountain is we're trying to build a place where students on campus can gather, where alumni are proud to come to. And so while this is about having an elite basketball program so or an elite facility so we can have elite programs, it's also about building community because we need to win and we need to have fans and people that do it with us. And so I think what the mountain at Mullen Park is going to do is not only kind of enable us to have great infrastructure for a basketball program, but it's going to help us facilitate the infrastructure around it from a fan engagement standpoint, from an alumni standpoint, um, such that everyone feels like they're part of this team effort and growing our programs moving forward. And so I think that vision excites our fans and our alumni as well. Yeah, just seeing like some of like the renderings and the videos of what that what it's going to look like on on the Pepperdine website, it looks a lot more like what we're starting to see from NBA arenas where like they kind of have like that concourse area outside uh, the area and you have those event venues and it, it, it's more attractive just to even be outside the arena, not just inside. And I think that just on a general front, that's like a huge component to like the the, the sports experience today as opposed to what it was even 10 years ago. Yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not building a gym we're building an experience, right? It's like NBA NBA teams or NFL teams are building these multi-use entertainment districts. We're, we're effectively creating our own multi-use entertainment district here right on campus. The, our student housing is sur surrounds that area. And so this is going to be the nexus in the center of campus. And it's not just good for our four teams who compete that will compete in the mountain. It's good for all of our students on campus. It's good for the Pepperdine community. This is our own district on campus where we're going to gather we're going to celebrate um, the successes of what we're doing. Now it's like, now take it a step back. It's like, you've been on the, this is your first AD job. Like, and now one thing I saw, like during your press conference, you talked about like, this was always kind of like the, uh, the eventual goal was to uh, kind of get back or to eventually end up in a role. And you talked a lot with uh, your old AD, Bob Blosky uh, from, from Stanford. Uh, as you, as you started to like continue to like learn how to on the job and everything else about the role that you're in, uh, what were like the com what are the what were the conversations like with Bob and like what sort of advice did he give you at kind of like stepping into this and even throughout the course of the process? It's funny you asked that. I was actually with Bob this last weekend back in Texas. Uh, he relocated there to be the commissioner of the Big Twelve Conference, and he's since retired. But we, we spent a couple hours together in Texas last week, and I mean, I, you know, I, I think with Bob. It was always about for him finding a place um, where you felt like you could have impact and a place where you felt like you, your values aligned with the values of the institution. And those, that was some good counsel that he gave me early on. Um, and, you know, I, I think that really aligns well with what I'm doing at Pepperdine. I think, you know, at Pepperdine as an institution, we want to be the global preeminent Christian university. That's a compelling vision to me as a man of faith. And the other compelling piece is that our president and our administration sees excellence in athletics as a way to support that vision. And so that's really meaningful to me. Here, it's not just about winning so we can uh, make our own kingdoms. It's about winning so we can build God's kingdom. For me, that's personally compelling. Um, so I, I think my values align. And then the opportunity to be successful is great. We are successful already, Zach, um, but we're not happy to be successful where we are right now, we want to elevate our success. And we're, as you know, the industry of college athletics is rapidly changing. And so 
Now's not the time for us to sit back and say, what's going to happen? Now's the time for us to double down and say, hey, no matter what happens in the future of college athletics, we know we need to do these things. And so we're, we're going already. We don't know where the puck's going. We think we know where it's going. Um, and we're moving towards where, where we think it's going. We're making those investments. We're doing the things that we think we need to do to be successful in the future. And then as we know where the puck's going, we'll pivot and make sure we're there. Yeah, because I mean, again, as you mentioned, like the the scope of college college athletics is, has changed, and one of the things obviously that has changed it quite a bit is what has been NIL and how has Pepperdine kind of like handled that end of it? Because like obviously, like it seemed like a lot of universities are handling it in their in their own ways, and the WCC schools because they are smaller institutions also deal with it in a different way. Uh, how has Pepperdine kind of like um, handled that end, and what's been the strategy? Yeah, I mean, uh, mind you, I'm six weeks in. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think we're still trying to figure that out. But I, I would say we've been very thoughtful about our entry into the NIL game. Um, we want to do it in a way that aligns with our values. And so I think that was part of the thoughtfulness in getting into what some people would call it slow. I would call it thoughtful. Um, but as of this summer, uh, we have formally have a collective up and running where our student athletes can truly capitalize on their name, image, and likeness. And, you know, I think, Zach, at, at any school, I would say um, you have to lead with what you're best at or where you can win. That's business strategy 101. If you try to do the same thing other people are doing, but you have less money, you're never going to win. And so I think for us, um, we are going to win with our unique and distinguished value proposition, first and foremost. We are a high academic, faith based school in one of the most beautiful places in America with a history of winning. That's why someone should come to Pepperdine first and foremost. But we can't be ignorant about the things that surround it. We can't expect to have poor facilities and still be successful. We can't expect to say, well, we don't need to do NIL and still be successful. And so we have to make sure that we play in those areas as well at a level that will inhibit our success. But at the end of the day, if we try to win by having the nicest facilities or if we try to win by spending the most money on NIL, then we're never going to win that way because the schools that are going to win that way are the schools that have the most money. We don't have the most money in Pepperdine, but we do have institutional assets that no other place has. And I actually think we're, we're kind of unique of one. There's no school like Pepperdine. And I think that's what really ad advantages us in the future. But, but NIL has to be part of our strategy. It is part of our strategy, but it's not the primary part of our strategy. All right, and as I as I kind of start to wrap this up and get you out, one of the things I did notice is that you are that one of the things you like doing is actually is mountain climbing. Have you gotten a chance? Because there's a lot of opportunities around that Pepperdine area. Have you gotten a chance to do anything yet, or um, or do you have plans to do any to get out to somewhere uh, nearby? Yeah, Zach. I, I, yes, I do like mountain climbing, and there's this great mountain or there's this great hill mountains of santa monica mountains and there's a cross at the top of it on campus that i want to climb to and by the way it's not lost in me that our new venue is going to be called the mountain as well um <laughs> i have not had time to do it yet i have been spending every waking hour of my time since i joined here focused on pepperdine or my family my family's not coming out till the end of this month from texas so pretty much it's been into the office at 7 30 out of here at 10 30 um, and I haven't had much time to get to the top of the mountain. But once I get settled, once I feel like we have our strategy defined and we're moving forward, you better believe that I'm having plans with my family uh, to climb to the top of those mountains. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot, Tanner, for hopping on. Uh, Tanner Gardner, the the newest director of athletics at Pepperdine University. Um, thanks for hopping on. We'll definitely uh, catch up down the road. And yeah, we'll talk. We'll talk later. Yeah, Zach. Hey, thanks so much for having me on. I'm very excited about the future of Pepperdine Athletics. I think our future is so bright. Um, and I look forward to hosting you at a game this year. I expect you to come down for a game. Um, and then two years from now, I look forward to showing you around uh, what I believe will be the nicest facility in the West Coast Conference and one of the nicest in the country. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. All right. God bless you. I want to thank uh, Tanner Gardner for hopping on one more time. Uh, great being able to chat with him and talk all about Pepperdine Athletics and where the direction of that program, what's going on uh, down in Malibu, uh, because this is a program that we know has a lot has a lot of potential despite uh, its size and its recent success, because we know they've had good a lot of success in the past. And so seeing this program kind of get back to where it once was on the basketball front, 
obviously it would be kind of an, a really exciting thing uh, to see moving forward. All right. Well, that'll do it for this episode of the unofficial WCC Hoops podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe on your favorite streaming services. Follow on social media at Post by Zach and at unofficial WCC pod. Well, that'll do it. Thanks for listening, everybody. And I will catch you later. Mm-hmm.